certain place we would like people seating so that we're kind of. Well, good morning and welcome to Emmanuel's live stream service. We welcome both members and guests to Emmanuel United Reformed Church's uh, service this morning. Indeed, there are, these are unusual times, unusual days as we've been hearing during the past two weeks. And yet, the Word of God continues to go forth. The Gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, continues to be preached and proclaimed throughout all the nations. And for that, we can be thankful. We can be thankful that the hope and comfort of Christ continues to be preached to the nations. The Lord in his time will bring us back to worship him corporately as one body, and so we can look forward to that. But meanwhile, we're thankful that you can listen to God's word being preached online. In a few moments, I'll be leading us in prayer. We have been sending out several email uh, prayer requests and updates concerning the life of the church here in Emmanuel. And so please be in prayer for those uh, in need of prayer at this time. 
We would greatly appreciate that. And also we want to remember the churches throughout the world as they seek to be faithful witnesses to the Lord Jesus Christ during this pandemic. We want to especially remember churches in Europe and the church in Milan. Uh, recently, uh, we heard from Pastor Mike Brown, who is the missionary pastor in Milan, Italy, that epicenter where the pandemic continues to grow and many people have died from this disease. Uh, Mike Brown informed us that there was a member in his congregation who was recently diagnosed with coronavirus and is currently on a ventilator. However, he is recovering well uh, from the treatment. Uh, there's also another member in his church who lost a family member from this disease. And so there's much to be praying for. And uh, in a few moments, I will uh, bring these to prayer before God. And I encourage you to join with me as we pray to our Heavenly Father. The scriptures, the psalmist says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. And also from Hebrews chapter 4, concerning the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, we hear this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Indeed, this is a time of need. This is a time where we can come before our Heavenly Father solely through the person and work of Jesus Christ, the one who ascended to God's right hand, so that even now the church universal, the church throughout this world can go before God and ask for his sovereign mercies, ask for his grace in our time of need. Let us do that at this time. Please pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you the great God of heaven and earth. You are the sovereign one, the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. And in this time of need, we come before you through our great mediator and high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who rules and reigns at your right hand, the one who conquered sin, death, and hell, and who gives us life and life eternal. And through his sacrifice upon the cross, O oh God, we know the forgiveness of sins and that life everlasting, life that began at conversion, when you caused us to be born again to a living hope. Oh Lord God, we thank you for such hope. We thank you for such comfort that in life and in death we belong to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who purchased us with his precious blood. Oh Lord God, we thank you that you watch over us, that you are a great shepherd, and that you lead and guide us, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, even in these times of uncertainty. Oh Lord God, once again, you remind us of your sovereignty and your providence. You remind us that man is weak and that we are powerless and that we need to trust in you, the sovereign one, the one who is in deep control of all things, for you created all things for your glory and for the good of your people. Oh Lord God, we pray for your mercy. We pray for your mercy towards those afflicted by disease. We pray for the churches throughout this world as we seek to minister to the people who are suffering from this coronavirus. We pray for the churches in Milan and throughout Italy. We pray for the churches in Spain and in France the church in China and other areas of the world, Lord, where they're, they're seeing an increased advancement of this uh, disease. And we ask, O oh Lord, that you would show your mercy, that you would help those in need and that in living or in dying, that our faith would be in Christ, that we would trust in your fatherly hand even when we don't have all the answers, O oh Lord. We know that you are still in control and you are still merciful. We pray for your wisdom, O oh Lord, your wisdom to be and abide with doctors, with nurses, with first responders, with the researchers, with our government, 
and the governments across this world. Oh Lord, may they submit to your word and your will. May they seek the good and well-being of their people whom they serve. Oh Lord God, we pray that you would grant wisdom from above and then, Lord, we would give you glory and honor for the ways in which you are working. Father, we pray for your comfort to the elderly, those who are in nursing homes. We have many families who have loved ones in nursing homes and cannot see them at this time. And so we pray for that peace which surpasses all understanding to be and abide with our loved ones who are in nursing homes. For the elderly who are homebound, we pray, Lord, that you would grant them grace and perseverance of faith and the comfort of your spirits. Once again, O oh Lord, may you show yourself powerful and mighty and merciful to those who are elderly and susceptible to this disease. We pray, O oh Lord, for your provision. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would be with those who have lost work due to this pandemic. We know, Lord, that many are struggling with uncertainties and where they will be in the next day or two and whether they'll put food on the table or whether they'll still have a job. We ask, O oh Lord, for your provision, for your grace to be upon them. And once again, Lord, we pray that they would fix their eyes on Jesus, that we would all fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would give patience to college students, high school students, elementary school students, all students who have suddenly returned home unexpectedly and uncertain about the coming months and year. O oh Lord, may you grant great patience towards them and help them, O oh Lord, to discern your will for their lives as they look to you, the one who is in control. And there is purpose behind all of this, O oh Lord. There is purpose and meaning. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant our students your grace and your patience to be able to press on in faith and not by sight. That they would hold on to you, Heavenly Father, and trust in your sovereign will and purposes for their lives. And also for those who have lost work, may they too cling to Jesus, cling to the hope that we have in you, Lord, and that you will indeed provide our every need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Father, we also want to pray for those who are struggling with fear and anxiety of the unknown. Oh Lord, grant us, your church, the body of Christ, opportunities to point people to the one who brings peace to the restless heart and brings comfort to the comfortless. The one who does and saves sinners and gives hope. Oh Lord, may we, the church of Jesus Christ, always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us and to do so with gentleness and kindness. Oh Lord, as many struggle with anxiety and fear, May they, they know the one who is in control and that we need not fear. We need to look to you in faith and humble, contrite faith, submitting ourselves to your sovereign rule, to your lordship, Jesus, and to your will in our lives. Your will is the best place for us to be in. And so we thank you, O Lord, that you are leading and guiding your church in your word and by your righteous right hand. We pray, Lord, for those who have undergone surgery in the past week or weeks, and we ask for your healing mercies to be upon them. We pray for those, O oh Lord, who have had doctor's appointments canceled, surgeries canceled, procedures canceled due to this pandemic. And as a result, they are going through pain. We ask, O oh Lord, for your tender mercies to be and abide with them and grant them, O oh Lord, pain relief during these times. Grant them the grace of perseverance, looking to you, Heavenly Father. For we know our suffering is not in vain. As the Apostle Paul says, through much suffering, we must enter the kingdom of God, whether that's physical persecution, 
verbal persecution, whether it's suffering of the physical kind, we, or whatever it may be, O oh Lord, emotional suffering, whatever it is, O oh Lord, whatever kind of suffering it is, we know, Lord, that you are with us and you will get us through because you're a faithful Father, a loving Father, and you have displayed your love for us. You have demonstrated your love towards us by sending your one and only Son, Jesus. Oh, Lord God, we pray for Pastor Mike Brown in the church in Milan, Italy. We ask, oh Lord, that you would be with this church as they seek to minister to one another through online resources, through internet. We pray that the word would encourage them as they are in lockdown mode. We ask, oh Lord, that you would be with Pastor Mike and his wife and son as they seek to be light and salt to the Italian people there, to be a witness and a blessing to those who are suffering due to this disease. We ask, O oh Lord, for this, for your healing mercies to be upon Sabino, who has the virus. We thank you, Lord, that he is responding well to the ventilator treatment. We pray for continued healing. We do pray for his wife, Alicia, and their two, two children, Mattia and Giulia, we ask, Father, for your mercy to be upon the family as they are not allowed to be around their husband and father at this time. But may the peace of Christ, the comfort of Christ, dispel all their fears and anxieties and give them that peace which surpasses all understanding. Oh, Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that we can come before you in this time of great need. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bring your people back once again to worship you corporately, person to person, face to face, so we, O oh Lord, can enjoy the communion and fellowship of the saints once again. But in the time being, Lord, we pray that your word will continue to go forth and continue to flourish and grow. We thank you for this gospel, this glorious gospel that gives us that hope and that peace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. With this time, we're going to turn to God's Word. I would like you, if you have your Bibles handy, to turn to the Gospel according to Matthew, Matthew chapter 14, for the reading of the Word. Matthew chapter 14, I'll begin reading at verse 22 to verse 33. And the title of this morning's message is Faith Over Fear. Faith Over Fear. This evening's message, which will be live streamed at 6 o'clock, will be Be Anxious About Nothing from Philippians chapter 4. So this morning we're going to be looking at the topic of fear, and this evening the topic of being anxious or worrisome. So I encourage you to join us this evening for that message. But for now, we turn to God's Word, Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse 22. <clears throat> Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when the evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. Please pray for me as we ask for God's blessing upon the preaching of the word. Let's pray. Gracious God and Father, Sovereign Lord, we pray that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see the glory of your word, the glory and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the salvation that he alone accomplished for sinners. We pray, O Lord, that you would move us, O Lord, to zealous works, that you would move us, O Lord, to a zealous faith, to serve you and love you in your kingdom for your glory. O oh Lord, feed your sheep, we pray. And so help us by your spirit and by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, fear can be defined as this. A strong urge to flee from danger in order to avoid it because of fright or because of dread, to flee from danger, to run from it, because there is great fright on the horizon. It's an imminent threat that is before us. Anxiety, on the other hand, is the inner emotional stress that occurs during a period of time. A person is in constant anticipation of something bad happening. And so you build anxiety within yourself. You become worrisome. <clears throat> That's anxiety. For example, someone may be anxious or worrisome about spiders. They watch a video and they see spiders or they see pictures of spiders and they become inwardly emotionally distressed. However, if you wake up one morning and you find yourself with a spider on you, you all, all of a sudden have great fear because there's an imminent threat, or so you think. That's the difference between fear and anxiety. Fear is that imminent threat that is before us. And anxiety is that, that process by which we become worrisome for the things that might happen to us. Today, there's both great anxiety and fear in the world over this virus this disease, this pandemic, and this anxiety and fear is around the world. The anxiety around the world is that there are so many unknowns about the virus, so many uncertainties about it, and the effects it will have upon a person's life. For example, the health of a loved one. I'm worried or anxious about that. Financial hardships. Will I have money? Food shortages. Will I be able to put food on the table? Will I lose my job? All of these worries and anxieties. It alters our way of life. But there's fear. Fear. For many, fear is imminent threat. A reality in their lives. The mortality rate of the disease rises and the most vulnerable and high risk are among the dead. And so for many, it's a very real and imminent threat, like in Milan, like in other parts of the world, where the disease spreads rapidly and is killing many thousands. Let me ask you a question. Is there any comfort during an imminent threat that causes fear? Is there any comfort during an imminent threat that causes fear? Friends, Jesus came to dispel fear. He came to give faith in him, the Son of God, who's in control of all things, visible and invisible. He's in control because he loves his sheep and gave himself up for his sheep. So there's no greater comfort in life and in death than the comfort of Christ. And these most comforting words, do not be afraid, it is I. It is I. 
Therefore, Christians have no reason to fear, and yet it's a daily battle, a daily struggle. Because Satan, the devil, wants you to fear. The flesh, the inner man, the sinful man wants us to fear. But Jesus brings assurance to the fearful soul. And we'll see tonight, he brings peace or calm of God to the restless, anxious, and worrisome heart. This morning, faith over fear. Look with me in your Bible at verse 22, where we see in our first point, Jesus' presence in the storm. Jesus' presence in the storm. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. You see, in the previous verses, Jesus fed 5,000 people plus men, women, and children, over 5,000 people in a deserted place, demonstrating that he's the Son of God and the Christ, doing the work of the kingdom. The kingdom of God has come in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where the king is, there is the kingdom. And so why did Jesus send away the multitude? Well, John chapter 6, verse 15 informs us. It tells us why Jesus sent them away. In that passage in John's gospel, the crowd wanted to make Jesus their king. But he did not allow it because his kingdom is not of this world. And furthermore, he was not ready. His work had not been complete. And so he sent the multitudes away, went up on a mountain by himself to pray. He even made the disciples get into the boat and leave him. He made his disciples. The word they're made can also be compelled. He strongly, strongly urged them to get into the boat. They didn't have a choice in the matter. Jesus made them get into the boat. You go. I am going to pray to my heavenly Father on the mountain, which is a very common theme in the Matthew in Matthew's gospel. The disciples are many miles away from shore, in the middle of the lake or sea, with the wind in their face, basically pounding them. The high winds, the boisterous waves. The water crashing in their face, throwing the disciples about, and there's an absent Lord, or seemingly absent Lord. You see, Jesus is alone praying to his Father, and in the Gospel, Jesus often prayed alone, and he prayed for whom? For himself and for his sheep, praying for them because he cares and loves his sheep. He loves his children, even now. Even now, he prays for us. He intercedes for us, which is a wonderful comfort for you and me that our prayers do not fall on deaf ears. Our fears are not a reality any longer because of Jesus Christ and through faith in him. We have faith that Jesus hears us. We have faith that our Heavenly Father hears us. The disciples encounter a great test of faith as the waves of the sea pound against the boat and knock the disciples around. They are gripped with fear. Gripped with fear. Did the Lord make us get into the boat only to send us to our death? Is that why he sent us out there? The Lord's praying to his Father. He's seemingly absent, but he's not. Verse 25 and 26, now in the fourth watch of the night, that is between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. It is a phantom. His disciples are troubled and feared with, filled with fear. And Jesus walks to them. He makes his presence known physically now. And he does so to comfort their fearful, fearful souls. However, they cried aloud in great fear because they didn't know who he was. No man walks on water. Who is this coming to us? Surely it must be a ghost. It cannot be a man, a physical man. 
so filled with fear that they couldn't recognize that it's Jesus who's coming to help them. Oh, how we fail to see Jesus by faith. How we fail to, to know and remember and confess that Jesus' presence is with us in the midst of the storm. Because when the storms of life come, when the trials in life come, Jesus all of a sudden is in the rear view mirror or is unnoticeable because we don't see him rightly. We cannot see him in the storm, but he's there. You see, in their presence, as Jesus walks them, Jesus spoke to them, be of good cheer or be of good courage. Be of good courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. In other words, I am with you. I am with you. I am present with you. These are timeless words for his sheep, brothers and sisters. Timeless words. Do not fear. How often do we see this in the Bible? Do not fear. Do not fear. Why? Because the Lord is with you. He is present with you. And his promise to be with you is fixed and firm. It's a promise. You see, these timeless words are throughout Matthew. Because in the beginning of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, we read that you will call, he will be called Emmanuel. Why? Because it is translated, God with us. In Jesus, God is with us. And Matthew concludes his gospel with, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so the, throughout Matthew's gospel and throughout the Bible itself, God reminds us of Jesus' presence to bring comfort, to bring courage, to bring cheer to the heart of the fearful soul. His presence in the storm provides the courage that you need in order to be still and know that He is God, that He is Lord. He is God in fearful situations. He is in control of all things. And because we belong to Him in body and in soul, in life and in death, He will always be our protector. He will always be our rescuer, our Savior. This is Jesus' promise to His children, to His sheep, to His elect. Jesus' presence in the storm. Secondly, the disciples' faith in the storm. Verse 28, please look in your Bible with me again. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Peter says, after hearing the voice of Jesus, after hearing Jesus say, do not be afraid, be of good courage, it is I. He says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Or it can be translated, since it's you, Lord. Since it's you, Lord, command me to come to you. Jesus' disciple Peter knows that he needs Jesus' permission and power to go out to him. That apart from Jesus' power, apart from Jesus' permission, it would be impossible for Peter to step out and go to the Lord. The only way that we'll have the power to go to Jesus is if Jesus calls us to himself as he called Peter. Peter hears the call to come to Jesus, but he still has to get out of the boat. Right? He hears the promise. He hears the word of the Savior. Come. But Peter has to get out of the boat. His eyes were focused on Jesus. His faith was focused on Jesus. And he began to walk on the water towards the Lord. But the sea, the sea was still boisterous. The waves were still pounding. 
the water splashing in Peter's face as he was walking to the Savior, fixing his faith upon the Savior. But then, as he gets near to the Savior, interestingly, as he gets near to the Savior, he loses focus, and the seas trouble him, and he becomes troubled and distraught. The external threat, the fear of the waves, the storm in life against him, resulted in him losing sight of the Lord. Verse 29, so he said, Jesus said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. He was shaking. He was troubled because of this imminent threat, this fear. And he began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. Now he's referring to being saved from physical death, from the sea becoming a watery grave. Peter was fear, fearing that he would be consumed by the waters. His faith was replaced with fear, losing sight of the Lord in the midst of the storm. One commentator says this, Peter was learning that problems arise when doubt replaces trust. Let me say that again. Peter was learning that problems arise when doubt replaces trust. Is that true for you this morning? We see here in Peter, one who was close to the Lord and yet was sinking because he lost sight of the Lord. The external threat caused him to lose sight of the Savior. And as this commentator says, the problems arose and doubt replaced trust. Fear replaced trust or faith. You see, the world right now is consumed with fear over the virus. And to be sure, we don't want to make light of it. It's serious and we must be wise and cautious in the way we deal with it and the way we talk about it. However, the, the Lord still rules and reigns. He rules and reigns over his creation at God's right hand. He rules and reigns in his church. He continues to lead and guide us. This did not take him by surprise. The Lord wasn't duped. No, the Lord is in control of all things. He is providential. All things come to pass by our Heavenly Father. Our trust in these trials is in the name of the Lord, as I quoted earlier, who is the maker of heaven and earth. Peter cried out, Lord, save me. Now I want you to take note of that. Take note of that. Peter was close enough to the Lord when he was sinking. In fact, he was so close to the Lord that the Lord was able to reach out his hand and grasp Peter's hand and bring him up. Verse 31, and immediately, and immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Peter was helpless and couldn't do anything to save himself from perishing in the sea. He had faith. He had little faith. But he had faith. It, was no, it wasn't no faith. It was faith nonetheless. And the Lord, by his grace and mercy, caught him and lifted him up. Friends, it isn't man who delivers us from death and the storms of life. It isn't man who dispenses the fear and anxieties. There's only one, the Son of God and Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who reaches down 
and grabs sinking sinners from the depth and pit of hell, from sin and from the grave. He alone saves us from sin. He alone saves us from eternal death, that is eternal separation from God. He is the only one who saves us from hell. This is why the angel told Joseph, and she, that is Mary, will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. By grace you are saved through faith, that instrument, the means by which we take hold to the promise of God in Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins, and the life everlasting. This text of Scripture is not a proof text that we can walk on water, and if we don't, we don't have faith. That's not what it means for us as Christians. Here, Jesus is declaring, demonstrating his glory, his kingship, his messiahship. He is the Christ. But what we learn here, what we learn here is that Jesus saves sinners. Sinners like you and me. And Jesus says, come. In Matthew chapter 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Come, sinner, to Jesus. And he reaches down. Come to him in faith and repentance. Because only faith in Christ overcomes the fear and the imminent threat. Listen carefully. The imminent threat of death and hell. That is the threat that is most imminent. That is the threat that is a reality to every human being. For Christians, this pandemic is truly a time where we pray for all peoples, for the lost. We pray that we would be unashamedly giving testimony to the lost of faith in Jesus Christ. That we would unashamedly give testimony that Christ alone has the power to save his people. And so now we look to the third point. First, we looked at Jesus' presence in the storm. Secondly, we looked at the disciple Peter's faith in the storm. Now the Lord's power to save results in confession and worship. The Lord's power to save results in confession and worship. Verse 32, and when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. This happened earlier, too, in chapter 8, verse 23 to 27. Jesus showing that he is Lord over the creation, being able to still the seas. Here, too, the wind ceases when the Lord and his disciple get onto the boat. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. You are the Son of the living God. He calmed the sea and the wind. He saved his disciple, disciple and demonstrated to all in the boat. He demonstrates to us here as we hear this word proclaimed. He demonstrates to all that he has the power to save. And therefore he is worthy of worship. Worthy of adoration. And worthy of praise. And here the disciples experience something really remarkable. Jesus is the Son of God, and he can be trusted. And faith in him overcomes fear, overcomes fear. If you have your Bibles open and handy there, please turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 15 to 19. We hear these words from the Apostle John. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, 
God abides in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as, as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. He first loved us. Friends, Satan takes great delight in this pandemic as he observes the masses gripped with fear. But as the Apostle John says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. He first reached down to us and grabbed our hand grab the sinner's hand, and Satan takes great delight in his pandemic as he observes many gripped with fear. Luther writes, Though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. His truth, his word, faith in his word, faith in the love that God has for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Luther goes on, The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. It's from a mighty fortress is our God. Yes, we endure trials. Yes, we endure pandemics. But we are safe and secure in the one who has the power to save, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God and Son of Man. Friends, the greatest fear and the most imminent threat to humanity is death. Because death is the absence of life. It is the absence of hope for unbelievers and unbelief. Death is the entrance into the unknown, and the unknown brings great anxieties great stress, and death is imminent, and it frightens unbelief. This pandemic once again reminds us and teaches us that we are powerless to save ourselves. Powerless to save ourselves from the reality and the imminent threat of death. The great news is that God is our help in our helpless estate, that God is God of love. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, that is eternal separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the good news. This is the love of God for fearful sinners. And back to 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, we read these words, In this is the love of God manifested toward us, that God has sent His Son, His only begotten Son, into the world, that we might live through Him. Romans 5, verse 8, But God demonstrates His own love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, Jesus' power to save Jesus died on the cross to save sinners by his precious blood, making us right with God, reconciling sinners to a holy God. He was raised on the third day, has power over the grave, power to save, power over the grave. He died for those who acknowledge their sin and in righteousness, 
who get out of the boat and trust in the word of the Lord, who have faith in the Lord. What is faith? What is faith, friends? Along with the Heidelberg Catechism said, true faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in his word, it is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These gifts are purely of grace only because of Christ's merit. Like Peter, we cry out, Lord, save me. Not because of the physical death. Lord, save me from spiritual death. So that whether I live or whether I die, I'm in Christ. I live for Christ and I die in Christ. Because in Christ alone, there's no fear, no fear in life or in death. Because nothing can separate his own from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. I want to conclude with two stanzas from In Christ Alone. And in a few moments, Carrie Baker will sing to us. And you're welcome to sing in, in your own homes these well-known songs. Or this well-known song, In Christ Alone. And she'll be accompanied by Lauren Vermeer on the piano. Stanza 1 says this, In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when strivings cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. And then the final stanza, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come before you thankful for your holy word. We thank you for the comfort that we know in the Lord Jesus Christ. That faith overcomes fear. Because you, O oh Lord, first loved us. And through faith in Christ, the fear that we have known has been removed, has been dispelled by the Spirit and love of Christ. And through his saving power and work. And we confess that truly you are the Son of God, Lord Jesus. May this confession, may this announcement to the world, this proclamation to the world that Jesus is the Son of God, lead to worship, lead to praise and adoration to your most holy name. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.